Hey, what's going on guys? Jerem Dastrup with Dental Intelligence and um, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about our guest today. This is an individual, Katrina Sanders, that is a dear friend and colleague of mine. And gosh, I mean, we, we met, let's see, that was, that was about 18 months ago, 16 mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah, yeah. And had an absolute riot. We were at a, a big dental show. Um, we were out dancing. We were having a good time. It was awesome. And since then, Katrina, as you know my feelings towards you, I just think you are an absolute rock star. Um, oh, inside thank and out. you. Thank You're you. A You're so person awesome. Person and human and for sure dental professional. And I'm really, really excited about um, the content that our viewers are going to see today. Um, something, a topic that is constantly talked about. Yeah. Um, we can always be improving not only our internal systems of how we are held accountable to our reappointment, but also how we can fix that, um, mm -hmm. how we can be better at it and how we can make sure that our patients are getting the care that they need. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you just rock this out. Oh, so, well, first of all, thank you so much for that intro. You're amazing. And, and you know how I feel about you and, and how I feel about dental intel and all the amazing things that you're doing. Um, today's program is going to be looking at one of the common challenges that we experience in the dental profession and particularly now during COVID and that happens to be reappointment, right? Um, so part of this profitability formula is making sure that we're creating an opportunity for our hygiene department to be optimized. As a dental hygienist myself, um, I want to stay busy. I would much rather have, uh, you know, appropriate utilization. I would rather have patients in my chair. That's what I went to school for. I'd rather do that than sit on the phone and call recare patients myself. <laughs> so today's program, we're going to look at how do you improve reappointment rate? Um, how is it that we can take the things that we've been doing that are working and institute those things, but also look at the fact that now we're in, I mean, I hate to use this, we've been overusing the unprecedented, uncharted waters, right? But we are, this is, it's a new time. There are new layers to the things that we're beginning to understand um, about dentistry, about our patients, better ways to connect with them, better ways to create opportunities to educate them. So we're going to be looking at the ways that we can step forward in supporting our patients through optimized reappointment. And the ways that we're going to do that is, as I've put together these kind of core strategies. So I've got four major core strategies that we're going to be looking at. The first is observing your overall utilization. And we're going to look at that in a quick moment. Um, essentially evaluating where is it that your reappointment rate currently is and where are the opportunities to in my uh, opinion, plug up the, the holes that are draining that bucket so that we can create a stronger foundation of our patient population. We're going to develop a patient-centered prescription. And again, as a practicing dental hygienist and as a periodontal hygienist, I work in a perio practice, um, it's important for us to be very targeted about how we prescribe appropriate reappointment measures for our patients. We're going to talk about why that word prescription is important in a moment. Step three, we're going to integrate a reappointment strategy. What does that look like in our practice? And finally, uh, one of my favorite terms, we use this often in our perio practice, inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. um, just because we've put together these strategies, um, things happen in our day. Doesn't it seem like we're always putting out fires in the dental practice? There's always something going on. Mr. Jones is coming in for an emergency. This happened. The pumps broke. I mean, we're always constantly putting out fires. And so although we've instituted these operations, we need to make sure that they're getting done. And so we need to take a look at what those strategies really mean, what is working in our practice, and how we can better optimize that. So are you ready, Jerem? Let's just buckle up and get started, shall we? I am so ready for this. Absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> Me too. There's nothing quite like talking about reappointment strategies <laughs> to really get us fired up. So I want to begin by talking about uh, observing your overall utilization. And there's some steps that we're going to be taking to do that. The, the first question is, 
how much open chair time exists within your hygiene column. And that is ultimately your score for what's called hygiene utilization. So sometimes I think we're not measuring the right things when it comes to the success of our hygiene practice. Some practices will use just a benchmark of, this is how much my hygiene department produced today. And in my opinion, that's not the only marker that we should be using to identify if we have a, pun intended, healthy hygiene department. I think a healthy hygiene department is one where we do have patients utilizing the hygiene services. So that means looking at how much open chair time is there, and, and this is a conversation for another day, but along with that, is your hygiene department diagnosing appropriately and then are patients aligning with that diagnosis? The other challenge that we know is the majority of doctor production comes from the hygiene chair. You do have a portion of patients that come in as emergency patients, and gosh, we love those emergency patients because they're driven, they're motivated, they're in pain, a tooth broke, they've got a cyst, right? So those are motivated patients. We don't have to convince those patients that they have a disease process they don't think they have. But a, a great amount of diagnostics that comes into the doctor's column is going to come from the hygiene column initially. And so what we tend to see is if the hygiene column is suffering, the doctor's column will subsequently begin to suffer as well. One of the other ways that we can observe utilization is looking at who's currently unscheduled yet overdue for hygiene visits. These are patients that need our wraparound attention, but I think we also need to be careful about are these patients that are truly patients of record? We need to be able to establish a line in the sand of when are we in a position where this patient is no longer needing our constant communication? Is this a patient who's maybe moved out of town? Is this a patient who's receiving care somewhere else? So that we can have a better synopsis or a better understanding of what our truly active hygiene patient population looks like um, and who within our hygiene patient population is truly considered overdue. And finally, the most important aspect of this conversation is who left the office without a future appointment. Um, we know that there is a closed loop system within a dental practice, meaning that our patients are coming in and they should be continually receiving our services. They should be continually seeing the hygiene department. Sometimes their next visit is a hygiene appointment and a doctor appointment. So we need to ensure that our communication from back office to front office and during handoffs is very clear that the next hygiene appointment is scheduled and if if there's a doctor appointment that needs to be scheduled or if there's a referral that needs to be communicated to the patient that that is done so appropriately. Once we have this information, once we have this baseline data to kind of better help us understand what our unique needs are within the practice, then we move on to developing this patient-centered prescription. And what I mean by that is we need to start to look at what is our reappointment uh, protocol and is it truly a protocol? We see every profi patient every six months. We see every perio maintenance patient every four months. And is a protocol, a, a streamlined protocol appropriate in your practice? Or should we be making prescriptions to the patient based on their own unique needs? So for this, Jerem, I'm going to take you a little bit, uh, I'm going to take you back in time, if you don't mind. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go back to the 1950s. I want you to meet, this is Bucky the Beaver. He's the <laughs> spokes beaver for Ipana toothpaste. And Bucky the Beaver in this toothpaste commercial would say, Brusha, Brusha, Brusha with brand new Ipana and see your dentist twice a year. That was the end of every Ipana toothpaste commercial. And it's because of those gosh darn commercials, Jerem, that we see patients twice a year. In fact, there's actually no reason why we should be seeing these patients twice a year other than the fact that maybe third-party payers cover that. But from a research standpoint, I think we need to do a better job in dentistry 
of making sure that we're looking at our own patient's unique needs. And that means looking at risk assessment. Now, I don't wanna to get too into the weeds of the clinical piece. You and I both know I could geek out on that all day. But the reality becomes when we take a look at what your provider is prescribing as a recare appointment, that needs to be appropriate based on the patient's risk or activity of disease. That's not just gingivitis or perio, that's caries risk. Uh, that's looking at the management of uh, oral cancer, uh, watching uh, active lesions, evaluating parafunctional habits that our patient may have, evaluating the link between oral and systemic disease and subsequent sleep disorders. And so, when we take a look at what our reappointment rate is, we need to take a step back and think, if our patients are coming in, if our patients have active gingivitis or active perio, is it possible that the recall appointment schedule that this particular patient on is actually not appropriate for them? And should we be having this conversation with them in a different way? So we do need to take a look at treatment considerations. We need to take a look at what is going to be appropriate based on our patient's needs. Yes, we can see patients on a routine uh, hygiene a reappointment schedule of anywhere between one to three months if this is a patient that has poor results after therapy, if this is a, an individual who has significant risk factors, what do those risk factors look like? Are we struggling to control periodontal conditions? Are we struggling to control decay? Um, are these individuals who have advanced or aggressive disease? What about their home care, um, especially now with COVID? We know that our patients are not taking care of their oral hygiene. We know that our patients have suboptimal nutrition. They're um, drinking more alcohol. They're smoking. They're instituting tobacco habits. They're bruxing. Um, what about individuals that have advanced attachment loss modalities like furcation involvements or possibly a complicated prosthetic device? It's not appropriate for us to say, well, let's do four months because that's what your insurance covers. We need to remember that we are the providers prescribing this for our patients. We can institute a three month uh, recommendation for our patients. And that would be if an individual had received a non-surgical periodontal therapy and the healing was relatively uneventful. Um, so we were able to stabilize some of this, um, but it's not that we're managing recurrent or refractory disease at this time. Um, these could also be patients, however, that do have risk factors, but at this time we're not seeing a progression of the disease process intervals of three to four months recommended for your clients that do have an adequate amount of maintenance and we're able to ideally control some of those significant risk factors and finally yes we can see patients every six months sometimes we can see patients once a year some patients simply have done a beautiful job of controlling their risk factors they've done an incredible job of being able to stabilize their periodontium uh, stabilize their decay rate and so because of that those patients may not need to come in every six months ultimately it's important for us to understand that when we discuss this with our patients when we say these are the, the uh, prescriptions that I have or the prescriptive reappointment schedule that I'd like to place you on, our patients need to know that that's a patient-centered prescription. Here's the deal. At the end of the day, I think we can all agree um, that there's an activity of disease that's continually progressive within our patient population. Almost one in two adults across the United States have some form of perio. And within the patient population who doesn't have perio, upwards of 90% of those adults uh, have challenges associated with gingivitis. In addition, we know 90% of adults have a history of dental decay. In fact, dental decay is the number one chronic childhood disease across the United States. And sadly, every uh, hour, one American in the United States loses their life from complications of oral cancer. And so it's important for us to understand that there is an activity of disease across our patient population right now, and it is concerning. The other concern becomes, do our patients have disease that we need to be re-evaluating? We want to step into a situation where we are active in the oral and systemic link. We want to step into a position where we can talk to our patients and say, 
I'm concerned that you have this infection in your mouth. And did you know that there's a, a link between diabetes and oral inflammation or a link between heart disease and oral inflammation? But we need to take the other approach as well. We need to step onto the other side of that line and be very clear with our patients that if they have unresolved oral inflammation, for example, that they could have a systemic disease. These are patients that may need to be tested for an immunocompromising condition. They may be HIV positive. They may be pregnant. Um, so we need to be continually evaluating this, utilizing salivary diagnostics or evaluating the concentration of saliva to better help our patients. If we want to be a part of the oral systemic link, we need to kick up a seat to that table and ensure that our clinical decision making best aligns with what those modalities are. This takes us into step three. Step three is integrating a reappointment strategy. So we specifically, when uh, we've established an appropriate reappointment schedule for our patients, then we need to start to think about how is this communicated throughout the hygiene hour? So more often than not, one of the things that I see, especially in hygiene departments, is that we walk through the dental hygiene process of care. The patient sits down in our chair, we review medical history, we take our, our vital signs, we gather radiographs, we perio chart, we you know, tell the patient, I'm, I'm concerned in this area, this area, this area, this is my plan for today, let's move on. We complete the appointment and you guys know what I'm talking about. The patient is already ripping off their bib and try, trying to get out of that chair. And you're going, wait, 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 let's schedule your next appointment while you're here. And unfortunately, one of my concerns is, is it possible then that our reappointment has become an afterthought based on the way that it's positioned within the hygiene hour? And so my thought process on this from a patient communication strategy standpoint would be making sure that when you're providing clinical decision-making communication to the patient, that reappointment is embedded in that. So, Jerem, that sounds something like this. Mr. Jones, I am, I'm concerned because today I'm seeing advanced areas of gum inflammation in your upper left and your lower right. I'm seeing advanced bleeding in those areas. The bleeding means that your blood vessels are open and the bacteria is entering your bloodstream in those areas. I am concerned. I love using the concerned word, um, especially if your dental professional is concerned. The patient should also be concerned. I'm concerned and I'd like to see you back in about four weeks to evaluate if we've seen a resolution of this inflammation. I'd also like to see you on a shorter recare appointment. I'd like to keep you on a shorter leash until we can keep this inflammation under control. Those are strategies that help the patient before I've even started hygiene therapy. Those are strategies to help the patient understand that my clinical decision making isn't, oh, and your insurance covers this, so let's make sure that we get you back in. It is a part of my plan. And finally, uh, considering building a reappointment at the 3, 6, 9, 12, or 4, 8, 12, or 6, 12 markers, meaning, Mr. Jones, it sounds like you like these 7 a.m. appointments. Let's get you scheduled at this 7 a.m. slot for your three-month intervals for the next year. This does a lot for the hygiene schedule. Now you have some control over keeping those patient appointments secure. Yes, if the patient falls off of their recare schedule, we may need to be doing some adjusting. But the reality becomes what you've done is you've built value. You've built value in the things that you're seeing. You're letting the patient know it's important that we get these appointments scheduled out. I understand you're busy and you're being very patient centered with that communication. I always think it's important from a patient communications standpoint to be very clear around your semantics. So um, one of the things that I tend to see uh, is dental hygienists particularly love to sugarcoat what we do and how we communicate this to the patient. 
Uh, I, I wrote an article a few years back called Sugar Coating is Decaying Your Practice. And I do believe that's true because when we sugarcoat things, we're not being very clear with the patient about what's going on. We're not coloring the picture about the level of disease and concern that we have. So when we say things like, I'm seeing a little bit of inflammation over here, the patient hears, oh, it's a little bit. It's not that concerning versus considering utilizing verbiage like I'm seeing early disease over here or even integrating your AAP staging and grading stating Mr. Jones I'm seeing stage one infection in these areas. Another thing that I think we use all too often in dentistry is the terminology of recommendation. Now, Jeremy, you and I both know a recommendation would be you should work out every day. A recommendation is make sure you eat your fruits and vegetables on your plate. A recommendation is take a multivitamin. Those are recommendations. But as a clinician, as a licensed professional, when you are saying this is the step or these are the layers that need to be integrated into your care to control the level of disease in your mouth, that's a prescription. So I think we need to get out of the habit of using the terminology of, I recommend seeing you on this because patients hear that as it's an option. And yes, patients have autonomy. They have the ability to make those decisions. But we need to be a lot clearer about how we build value in those modalities. Avoid acronyms. We use so many acronyms in dentistry and it's very confusing. Yes, we need to do SRP and then let's do a PFM and an MODBL on 14 and 15. <laughs> patients are like, what are they talking about? So we need to be able to educate our patients based on things that they understand. If you take nothing else away from our time together, Jerem, um, the term cleaning drives me crazy. I am a licensed professional. I treat inflammation. I am a physician of the head and neck. I am an inflammatory specialist. I provide periodontal therapy. I stabilize or reverse disease. I am not a cleaning lady. You will not see a Swiffer or a feather duster in my operatory because that's not what I do. So it's important for us to remove that. And that needs to be a wrap around concept. Our front office team should not be saying you're due for your dental cleaning. It should be you are, um, we need to get you scheduled for your preventive treatment or your preventive uh, maintenance therapy or your non-surgical therapy. Um, our verbiage is so important. It colors the picture for our patients about what it is that they should be expecting when they present in the operatory. And finally, let's inspect what we expect. Uh, we need to ensure that our prescribed recall interval is clearly denoted in our practice management software. If we don't have those continuing care modalities set up in the back, then it's difficult for a front office team or whoever's working our recare appointments to to understand what was this patient prescribed as from a reappointment standpoint. Also, we need to be clearer about which recall procedure is appropriate for each patient. I can't tell you how many times, Jerem, I step into a practice and I see that patients are on both a Profi and a Perio maintenance recall schedule. That doesn't make sense. The patient this month comes in and they have no history of perio. And so we're providing a preventive therapy on the patient. And then three months later, oh, turns out this patient now has a history of perio. So we're providing a therapeutic modality to maintain the periodontium at a reduced state at where it is. But then three months later, let's go back to putting that patient on a profi. They have no history of perio and we're preventive in nature. That doesn't make sense, um, and it's not appropriately reflective of what it is that your hygienist is performing in the back. Your hygienist is performing a perio maintenance every single time. Your hygienist is gathering comprehensive probing depths, recession numbers, evaluating for cations and mobility. Your hygienist is articulating on root surfaces, scaling on cementum, articulating into a mesial concavities of roots and for cation involvements. And so we need to be very targeted about what that procedure is so that we're not creating confusion for our patient. We need to ensure that every patient leaves with a next appointment. That's the time right then and there while you have that patient's undivided attention to be able to approach scheduling that. And again, making sure that you're doing it, not when the patient's trying to rip off their bib and get out of the operatory. I know it's shocking to us in dentistry, but 
the patients don't want to spend extra time in the dental chair than they have to. So we need to be mindful of that and making sure that that's instituted throughout our, our hygiene appointment. And finally, making sure that we're employing appropriate communication strategies to stay in constant contact with patients who did not reappoint or needed to move those appointments. What does that look like within our practice? Who's responsible for that? And how can we continue to keep these patients on target for their hygiene care? I want to thank you so much for your time, um, for uh, you know unpacking this uh, information with me. Um, I, I this is obviously something that I'm really passionate about because I do believe that as a, a hygienist, that you know part of the role that we have is in making sure that our communication is clear and concise, and that we're supporting our front office team in excellence. Um, here's my contact information. Please let me know if there are ever any ways that I can support. Uh, please feel free to find me online, www.katrinasanders.com. Uh, slide into my DMs on Instagram, Facebook, or you can email me, katrina at katrinasanders.com. Um, thank you so much for your time. This, is, this has just been wonderful, Jerem. I, I appreciate you having me on. Oh, this is great. And I could just, I could listen to you talk all day. No joke. Like oh, I, I, so lo I love I love the seriousness that you um, that you carry in your responsibilities as a dental professional. Like I, I can feel it, I can see it. Um, you're always looking to better yourself. I want to I want to point out a couple things before we close things down today. Yeah. Um, I love the flow that you just took us through, right? Because it it was th these are these are things, and this is a concept that that we're taught constantly. We hear it in our our CE all the time. We hear it at events that we go to. We hear it a part of study clubs that we're attending. That reappointment is a major part of the practice. Patient care, obviously, um, coming with that, and and dental professionals looking for for the growth to gain that perspective, right? Of, and I love what you just did. It wasn't like, this is what needs to be done. It's how we get ahead of it. So it's no longer a problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That, that yeah. there's things yeah. that we can do from the beginning that through one visit with that patient, what I took from it, and you guys, I'm not a dental professional. Like I, I, I haven't been in an operatory. I, ha I haven't been inside of a mouth. I've had people looking at my teeth but I've never been the one looking at someone else's. And so um, call it like Dr. Seuss simple, right? And, and you guys have, that have watched these videos know that I use that terminology a lot because I am Dr. Seuss, meaning like I need things really simple. And the process mm -hmm. that Katrina just took us through was once they're in the chair, here's some vernacular, here's some mindset changes that we need to have and that we need to change as a dental professional so by the time our patient is leaving, they have felt like they've received optimum healthcare mm -hmm. and they're, they're ready to come back for their next visit. And whether that is preventative, that visit's going to be prevent, or there's going to be another treatment that takes place, they're comfortable with that. And so um, I challenge all of our viewers to really go back and, and watch this multiple times. There are a lot of uh, nuggets laced through this. And so Katrina, thank you so much. You're so awesome. Big oh, high five. Virtual thank high Thank you. Five. Yes. I love it. Virtual <laughs> high five. Thank you, Jerem. It's been an honor. I appreciate it. And guys, make sure you take advantage of um, this incredible woman's knowledge. Reach out to her if you have questions. I mean, she just gave you the invitation. Send her a message on, on social media. Send her an email. Um, if you're struggling with something, you know, like she's there to help. She is there to help, mm -hmm. help you become a better dental professional. And as far as Dental Intel is concerned, we've got an incredible technology and platform that will only help you manage and lead your position in dentistry by using the technology to ensure that all of your patients don't leave without a scheduled appointment in the future. And so um, check us out, dentalintel.com. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. And Katrina, thank you once again for uh, joining us and adding value to us as dental professionals. Thank you. Hey guys, have a good one. We'll see you. Bye.